Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our session. So this is um, the SPP Pharma Chapters event today, and we're going to be talking about how pharma procurement is driving our sustainability goals. And so with that, we'll just do some quick introductions of the team that's going to be presenting today. And uh, starting off with Fred, do you mind uh, introducing yourself? Hey, folks. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. And uh, special thanks to SVP and the presenters today. Fred Turco, I lead enterprise and direct sourcing for Pfizer. And I also help drive some of our sustainable sourcing practices within Pfizer and co-chair SVP Pharma. Really happy to be with you today. Rob? Sure. Yeah, I'm Rob Williams, Director of Sustainable Procurement at AstraZeneca. I'm leading our sustainable procurement program across Scope 3 and a whole range of other sustainability factors. I'm also Vice Chair of the Pharmaceutical Supply Chain Initiative, PSCI, and a proud ambassador for SPP. Maria. Hi, everyone. I'm Sustainable Sourcing Lead at Pfizer, driving supplier impact uh, for Net Zero program in Pfizer. Thanks for joining. Hi, I'm Zelia Kranich. I co-lead the um, Pharma chapter along with Fred and Maria, and I work with Perigo, and I work on sustainable sourcing as well as facility sustainability. So thank you again for every, everybody for joining, and we will get started. So before we get going, I'm sure you've heard this about a million times today, but this session is going to be recorded. Uh, it's a collaborative event, so we'd like to hear from you. We'd like you to ask questions along the way, and we will definitely have time for a really good discussion at the end of our session. Also, feel free to spread the word about SPP. And this is really exciting, but I've heard that we're now trying to build a community of a million. I remember when Fred and I started working with this group uh, back a few years ago, we were thinking 10,000 was a lofty goal that we would never get to. So a million is um, quite exciting. So how do you join in more officially? I'm sure most of you are already ambassadors, so you know all about that. But you can also become a co-lead for a chapter. You can also have your organization join as a champion, and then there are other sponsorship opportunities as well. And so feel free to look at the SPP website to learn more. So why are we so concerned about procurement? Why do we keep having these discussions about procurement's role? Well, you can see from this slide here that procurement is more than 90% of a company's carbon footprint. So in addition to the supplier piece, which for Pfizer is around 60%, for other companies it could be as high as 90%, but quite a range. But overall, once you start adding everything together with our facilities, our fleet, our logistics, our business travel, it's quite a bit of influence. So something that definitely can't be ignored, procurement is a real driver in the decarbonization space. So an organization that's near and dear to my heart, I was involved with them for many years, um, and now we have Rob on this call who is, is very actively involved, but PSCI is a group of pharma companies or companies that work very closely with pharma, um, also a very fast-growing organization, now up over 80 companies are involved, but what we've seen through PSCI, through SPP, and through a number of other uh, things that I'm going to talk about coming up in the next few slides. Pharma is definitely all about collaboration. Um, there's no shortage of different things that we work on together. We know that we all need to work together in order to create real change, that this isn't something that we consider competitive space. It's about working together and it's about con considering our, each and every one of our peers, partners, as well as our suppliers being partners. So quite a bit of work for us to all do, and we all do it together. So I mentioned that PSCI, and so PSCI has a decarbonization team that has a lot of great tools for figuring out how to do this within your company. There's also the Energize program that has second to none 
supplier training events, as well as a number of training tools that are available on their website. Energize started out being nine or 10 companies that got together in pharma. Now it's up around 18 or 19. So also um, something that Schneider Electric is running and Schneider Electric has always had these wonderful tools for us to use, but now they've enhanced that and made them available for free to everybody within the Energize program. And Manufacture 2030 uh, has an Activate program. So not only can M2030 help you with tracking your data, but they can also give you resources and tools for getting expert advice, for doing product carbon footprints, and um, they can help integrate you with financial lenders that can help you with it, get on the right path and make sure that you're moving along in your decarbonization journey as well. So all kinds of great things all around collaboration. And with that, um, the Sustainable Markets Initiative is near and dear to Rob's heart, and so I'm going to pass it along to Rob. Thanks, Zelia. Thanks. And, and building on what you were saying there about capability building, because that's a key part of, of the journey that as procurement, we all know our suppliers are on. Actually, whether it's sustainability, whether it's quality, whether it's time, whether it's whatever it is, we always want our suppliers to improve and, and work hard with them so through supplier relationship management once they're in contract to, to make that happen. And that capability building actually is fundamentally can be built on these, what, what's on the screen now, it's common expectations. Because suppliers really struggle, you know, we often hear um, in engaging our suppliers that, you know, they want to hear consistent approach. You know, why can't the pharma companies all come together to kind of at least ask us the same thing? And that's what the Sustainable Markets Initiative, one strand of the Sustainable Markets Initiative, initiative has set out. So just a bit of a step back about what is the SMI, what is the Sustainable Markets Initiative? Well, it was founded in COP26, uh, Glasgow, Scotland, uh, back in uh, a couple of years ago now. And it was set up by then Prince Charles, now King Charles, actually, with a whole group of CAOs, not just in the health sector, but across a whole range of industry sectors. If you've not looked at SMI website, take a look, look at the sector that's relevant for your business and see perhaps how you can get involved. Because many of the farm, many of the um, task forces underneath the Sustainable Markets Initiative are going to be relevant to your business. There's the Health Systems Task Force is the one that actually Pascal Sorio, who is who is the CEO of AstraZeneca, chairs. Um, he leads that with you can see the organisations on the left there. And in fact, there's a, there's a new member in that, which is Novartis, which has recently joined the, the SMI as well. Um, but those organizations at CEO level are connected to really help drive direction. Um, it's a fantastically powerful um, uh, you know, group of individuals and companies who are looking to really help the industry move forward, um, to help set direction, to sponsor, um, sponsor projects. And I'll come to one of those in a moment. But one of the early work streams under the under the health systems task force of the sustainable markets initiative was around setting common action and expectations for suppliers because as I just said is recognize that that's one of the barriers to change is that we keep asking for different things so we came together these standards were then set and adopted um, they've been published on the website of the smi they've been published in an open letter signed by the ceos of those organizations there and we in procurement in AstraZeneca, and I know through PSCI, I know other pharma companies are using this to really help drive direction. So um, when that question comes from suppliers about, well, everybody's asking us different things, this is particularly direct materials we're thinking of here, then we can point to this and point to the efforts that we're making as pharmaceutical companies to get aligned on our asks to help the suppliers who we often share move faster. So we're all asking them the same things. And we're asking from disclosures at the top of the list there, disclosing emissions. Um, we've got that assess and disclose scope one, two and three emissions. We don't specify through a particular system, but we know that many companies will use CDP, Ecovardis and other platforms, third party platforms to actually disclose that data, not just to one customer, but to many customers. Science-based targets. Well, obviously the top line tells us where companies are today. The next line really tells us where companies are headed, that SBTI pathway. And then flowing down from there, 
levers that help that decarbonisation, help those companies be more sustainable, particularly the renewable power piece. And Zelia's already mentioned Energize, which is a programme to build the capability of suppliers, help them understand how to switch to renewable electricity in different ways. And this is a common target here that talks about moving to at least, and it's got to be at least 80% um, renewable electricity by 2030 and making that commitment public. Um, and that's a key part of, and I'll come back to that, making it public shortly. But again, just this helps procurement. Having these common standards really helps address some of the questions that procurement face when they go to speak to suppliers. It also sets out really clearly where we as companies who are members of this, this organization and, and indeed members of PSCI who've adopted these as well, that's where we can start when we look to build, build additional aspects into our supplier code of conduct. We build additional aspects into contract clauses. So really, again, provides a start point practically of actions we want suppliers to take through a contract. We might want to bind them to take these actions as well and levers they can pull to actually deliver on decarbonisation. Next slide, please, Celia. So I mentioned one of the projects that the SMIs launched. Um, and in many places around the world, buying renewable electricity is, is a retail option. It's, it's relatively simple. You know, you can pick up across Europe, across North America, across many other companies. You can pick up the phone to the energy provider and, and ask to source renewable electricity or your broker. Um, in some parts of the world, the market's more regulated, it's less mature, um, it's developing and, and renewable electricity, renewable electricity generation in China is enormous, but the access to that renewable electricity is not as simple as it, as it seems in, uh, in Europe and North America. So because China and indeed India, uh, which is another major um, country for pharmaceutical production, I think in fact about 50% of global pharmaceutical production happens in India or China, um, SMI took action to really prove what could be done. And again, using the power of that CEO initiative, but joint procurement activity. And by jointly acting together, clearly there's, there's, the, there's the emphasis of scale. There's the emphasis of importance. Um, there's the emphasis of you know acting together to make market change happen where it's necessary and bringing together new and innovative partnerships, which is what we did here. Um, you can see the logos on the left there. Not all of the SMI members took part in this. And indeed, we took part with one of the key suppliers to the pharmaceutical industry you see named there as well. But we found a partner in Envision Energy. Um, a leading operator of uh, wind and solar technologies in China um, with a strong profile, a member of the SMI Council, and indeed themselves signed up to science-based targets and taking action. And we provided a route. We secured AstraZeneca and, and these other companies secured a power purchase agreement. We've secured renewable electricity from the 1st of January this year in a market first move that then gives three years for us. But on the right hand side, in terms of the green, the really important part of this was we left the door open in that agreement to for others to join during 2024. And in fact, that's an activity which is currently taking place. There's been two webinars in the last three weeks in, in the UK and in Chinese to offer this option to suppliers in the pharmaceutical supply chain. Now, so across chemicals, across packaging, across all sorts of different direct material sectors there and indirects as well. And that's to really help those companies accelerate. It would have taken a lot of time, a lot of individual investment, a lot of capability building within the suppliers. But what we've done here is created a contractual model, essentially, that can be rolled out and shared with others. Um, each individual company that's invited to this, it's very much an invitation to take part, but with the encouragement that, well, they'll be decarbonizing their operations, it decarbonizes our scope three. So it helps the whole industry move forward. And there's real commercial imperatives behind this in China now as well, with the EU carbon border adjustment mechanism, with the Chinese ETS emissions trading scheme, as well as increased customer requirements. But it's the joint procurement activity I really want to flag here. That is the power of that collective action that Zelia talked about, the partnerships, the collaboration, the working together to unlock a market, to unlock access, to allow then the industry to decarbonize. So hopefully a great example of how farmers acting together and perhaps what can be taken forward in other sectors as well. Or welcome, of course, any follow up to to join this if it's relevant for, for you and your business. Next slide, please. I think the final slide for me then is, is really about, as I've just touched on before, this commercial imperative. Um, the little bit of text in the bottom is, is important, actually. 
says that your organization needs to show public commission public commitment and leadership for sustainability whether that's diversity equity and inclusion whether it's climate action because that public commitment and leadership from from our board from your board is superbly important it gives procurement the leverage to drive commitment and action by your suppliers if you're not doing it then why should your suppliers do it it gives you know seeing that from the board having a ceo letter a ceo slides a pre presentation by your cpo as it may be really gives the power and the leverage to it's a door opener um, we ourselves, we've run a supplier conference. That was how we started our supplier engagement on sustainability. It was really powerful to get our board member, our CPO, um, to be talking to, I think it was 800 to 1,000 of our suppliers at the time, a couple of years ago. Um, that really opened the door then and gave a, a start point, a, a door opener for procurement for all the category managers to go and speak to their suppliers, point back to the conference and go, you heard the messages, what are you doing about it? Um, and how can we move forward together? And how can we help you? And raise all of those questions. But that door open is really important. And it's really important not just to pass the message on, but it's really important to start that education journey as well. The capability building that Zelia talked about is not just capability building in suppliers. It's often, as we know, that's why the SPP came together. It is really building capability within procurement to negotiate to net zero because that's what we're asking everyone to do in procurement is to do that alongside all of the other activities and, and procurement actions and contract issues that we need to think about. And so, but having that leverage again, point at the bottom is really helpful, we found to, to support the procurement team to, to move forward quickly. But the commercial, commercial imperative is also, you know, for internal stakeholders and for suppliers is just a reminder. And that's the point you've got really in the three boxes across the slide central there, the business value um, to upstream and downstream, um, the license to operate ahead of regulation, the, the employee re recruitment and talent retention we're finding as a business in procurement is really important. Um, the top line business growth and, and the access to funding via ESG lending. That's a really important point when it comes to CDP ratings or even Ecovardis ratings. If you're going for debt funding or equity or looking for other investors, being able to, for one of your suppliers to be able to put up those labels to demonstrate that they have strong environment, social and governance. And there's a strong emphasis there on the G of governance. That means their business is well understood, well managed and well understood and well managed should mean lower risk to any lender. And that's where the linkage comes. McKinsey, some years ago, produced a paper that quite well demonstrated the link between long-term financial returns and those who had a stronger ESG profile because of that understanding of the business, governance of the business, well-managed businesses perform better, managed through risk environments better. In terms of the cost, sustainability should not cost the earth. Um, Green options are often spoken about as costing more. That's obviously where procurement really comes into its own. It's absolutely what we do day to day is to really mitigate the direct costs to look at whether it's energy efficiency, whether it's resource efficiency, whether it's actually the raw material has got nothing to do with the oil price, the gas price, the price of other commodities that we've used historically. It's an entirely new commodity supply chain that's bringing the new bio material into, into the company for us to buy. I've mentioned the, the CBAM, the carbon border adjustment mechanism already. But then the public commitment and leadership is hugely important. And again, it's not just about being seen as a leader as a business. It's about being seen as a leader to influence others, to get that supplier cascade, that cascade into the supply chain. You know, your buyer power for procurement, I've heard it said before, I think in SPP circles, your buyer power is your superpower. You're influencing other businesses to make change happen. And we've seen that with a lot of our suppliers. We've engaged with them to sign up to science-based targets, to disclose to CDP. And those conversations are really quite tough to start with, but then they understand and they come to come to understand why we're asking for it and the rationale. And, and in healthcare, by the way, it's because healthcare creates 5% of global emissions. That's more than aviation. So as much as we're creating solutions that can change people's lives, we've also got to be very mindful that in the process of doing that, we've got to do that without impacting on the planet and society as a result of what we're actually creating. So that's a real purposeful link from sustainability through to our core business. Wide range of considerations, all for leverage with suppliers, all for leverage with stakeholders, but really underpinned and, and empowering procurement by your own business taking public leadership in this space. And I think at that point, I'm handing to Fred for the next slide. And so Fred, over to you. Thanks, Rob. So 
We're going to start this part of it with some questions uh, for you to consider. Uh, and as a procurement colleague or supply chain or some other um, part of that kind of profession, uh, this hopefully will resonate because we're going to talk about cost. But before I do that, I'm just going to ask the question is, when was the last time you were forced to make a binary decision? Meaning it was a win or lose that you had to choose one or the other. And it could be um, in the procurement circle, it could be that you had to choose quality, cost, or price, right? And we always try to get all three from a value proposition with good planning and others. But sometimes you're forced to take timeliness uh, and sacrifice a little bit on price and never really sacrifice on quality in our space. But you get into those decisions, um, or it could be in a life circumstance where it just didn't feel good that you were in a binary kind of win-lose position and um, ultimately didn't feel good about the overall experience or worse, when was a time where you didn't have a decision, the decision was made for you uh, and you felt like you're kind of didn't have overall control. So maybe it's someone that cuts you off in traffic. Um, they didn't follow the traffic patterns or others, right? They use the emergency breakdown lane, they cut you off. Those are even more emotional, right? Than the binary win lose, right? Because you didn't weren't given a choice. Someone didn't follow the rules and didn't make a decision. My point in sharing that um, and those questions is, um, I feel like at times sustainability, uh, environmental social responsibility, uh, or other aspects are put into very binary terms and can get political and others. And some organizations are changing ESG to be impact statements because ESG is more political. Um, but I'd say for us in procurement, our role in supply chain um, within organizations, it's it's much more of an ant than it is an or. And to Rob's point previously, for many of us that have been practicing in this space for some time, we can continually demonstrate that, which is why we mm -hmm. get the latitude to continually work through solutions. So I have a couple of slides on cost, but I think more generally, um, our job as procurement uh, folks is one to influence the supply chain, influence demand, drive costs down, and make this more feasible for companies to get the fiduciary responsibility back to shareholders, others, right? If you're in a corporation and the environmental benefit going forward. So when we look at that, this cost structure will give you kind of a sense of with demand increasing, these costs will go down. So just think about this as a, a static and thanks to BCG for sharing these slides, but it's called the marginal abatement cost curve. And I'm gonna get in more detail in the back, these slides will be shared. And again, thanks for BCG, but they're illustrative. And that if you have demand management, other cost reductions, you will um, be able to have actually um, cost minus, you're saving costs for the company. Uh, and then if you go into the solution uh, that the maturity of that solution is less, obviously the cost is higher, right? So overall, as industries, we're looking for people that mirror our values that look to get to the end in terms of ESG and other things, including decarbonization and drive that cost reduction overall down so we can all decarbonize in an appropriate way for our respective companies or organizations. Next slide. Thank you, Zelia. So this gives you a little bit more detail. And again, thanks to BCG for sharing this. I haven't changed anything on the slide. I think it's a fantastic slide. Now, what I would say is, um, similar to what Rob and others experience in different organizations, the more mature you are in your organization, I think this cost structure shifts to the left, not to the right. Meaning for scope one, scope two, uh, primary facilities, fleet, uh, other decarbonization effort and the activities um, based on scale or collaboration through consortium buys and others, uh, virtual power purchase agreements, demand management, others, um, generally, we've seen that cost structure on a normalized uh, cost per CO2 or tons of CO2 reduction to be further left. And what I would share by sharing these slides is as you build your business case out or you refine your business case or refine your practices, there's a maturity of this going forward, your geography, your access to um, whether that's policy or other tax provisions within policy, uh, Western Europe, Central Europe, 
uh, North America. And then as you go out in your operation to LATAM, uh, APAC, and as Rob said, those solutions became maybe a little bit more difficult. There is a little bit of governance in terms of state to state within countries in terms of carbon and others. And as the complexity gets higher and higher and going further to the right, I think it requires more collaboration within organizations, even big organizations like Rob listed and many of those teams to get to a consortium by and others. This is not a competitive space. We don't see this as drawing a competitive advantage to Pfizer or other organizations. It's a space that we need to collaborate in more to help drive costs down through utilization. Next slide, please. So what is procurement's role in delivering ESG agenda? Uh, it's our role is to uh, drive demand and partner with companies that mirror our values. Rob started with, if you have board executive level of sponsorship, you know, in terms of driving the why, and then being able to execute with that sponsorship, the ability to execute across is important. So if, for instance, we had 20 billion in spend, maybe within Pfizer last year, just a rough number times a hundred, then we get to over a trillion dollars of influence or revenue uh, from a corporation standpoint. So supplier diversity, uh, environmental net zero commitments, other ESG kind of parameters from compliance all the way up through, we can influence through that competitive bid process, uh, supplier relationship management and others, but it's not relative to our spend, it's relative to the revenue of those companies. So it's concentric like it shows here. Um, every time we ask, that ring goes out. So if we ask and others commit to SBTI, for instance, then that supply chain tier one, tier two, tier three expands. So our direct influence is over a trillion dollars of revenue. Those organizational revenue influence expands out further. And you can see how this starts to become more of a dynamic and market trend rather than individual. So it goes from one to many, to many, to many. And I think that's an important in procurement supply chain. Professionals are a key catalyst for that. Uh, our job is to find solutions, not to just drive costs, but to tr find innovative solutions. Uh, a lot of my role in previous life was safety. There's a whole hierarchy of control and solutions and kind of technology that you look at. I'd say in the environmental space and other spaces, it's similar. Right? There's not one way to decarbonize. There, hopefully there's multiple ways, right? And our job is to help drive and look for those solutions, scout for those solutions, bring those back to our organizations so we can manage the commitment that we have respectively with cost going forward. And the more we can do that, the better the cost curve will be. Reducing cost, talked about that quite a bit. Uh, it's my day job, right? For, likely for many of you as well. But there's an and associated with that. People, planet, and profit uh, as we go forward. Improving resilience and quality. Rob talked a little bit about that of license to operate. Uh, we saw that with some of the energy exposure through a war in Europe and the energy prices going up. And where we had more renewable energy, uh, we had a lot less exposure uh, from a business continuity standpoint, but also from a cost standpoint. And then lowering risk profile. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of a flavor between uh, Zelia, Rob, myself, and then Maria is going to look at some of the questions and help delegate these questions if we can move to that slide. But I do want to thank uh, all the presenters today for doing a fantastic job and SVP for organizing this before we get to questions. Thank you, Zelia, Robin, Fred. So there are 232 people in the session. I hope you found the what you heard so far interesting. Please ask more questions. I'm sure it drove to some questions in your mind. There are just a couple in the chat. I want really to encourage you to ask whatever questions I can help you driving even more in your company. So what we have for now is a question for Rob. That's there's a person asking, does SMI apply just to pharma or all industries? And a related question also to Rob, as in, does it have other industry-specific common standards or just one set applicable to all markets? Okay, 
Thanks, Maria. Now, I think, as I said during the presentation, the SMI, and it's worth, I will, we'll see if we can post the link to the Sustainable Market Initiative in, in the chat. Um, I don't know if, if one of the team can find that, but take a look at it. There's a whole set of task forces under there. I'm aware there's an energy one. Um, obviously, I'm aware there's a health uh, systems task force. There's one that is a sector initiative, essentially, for many of the industry sectors. So, I think there's probably something there for most organizations. Um, so, yeah, do take a look see what underneath that task force are the key work streams that they're working on so in pharmaceuticals it happens to be supply chain standards happens to be clinical trial or digital health including clinical trial decarbonization and a couple of other areas as well which really focus on that decarbonization of the of the industry so there's different sectors in there it doesn't just apply to to healthcare on the common standards actually i, I can't comment on the other what the other sector initiatives are doing because I'm, I'm not in those other sector initiatives but i think there is a kind of common approach that's sought to be adopted so i suspect you may find under some of the other in industry sectors that similar approaches are taken that they've kind of looked at what are the common standards we can do um but can't comment for general i don't know whether fred or zelia you uh, you know at all for the other smi um industry sectors whether there's any common standards but um hopefully that helps and we'll see if we can get a link in the chat to the website for uh, for follow for by by folk. Perfect, thank you, Rob. And a question for Fred: How do you facilitate an external conversation around the Mac? Yeah. So, how do I facilitate an external conversation around cost? Right. That's what we do every day. Um, so, first is uh, segmentation, right, of suppliers by maturity and others. Um, but for Pfizer, we try to keep it pretty simple uh, and across, not just the, the space that my team leads for spend, spend management and kind of sourcing and, and contracting globally. But across Pfizer, uh, we want to enable our colleagues to put this into a competitive sourcing environment where we look at maturity um, and then look at how well a supplier is managing certain aspects of ESG supplier diversity, uh, as well as uh uh, decarbonization or net zero commitments or other SPTI, et cetera. When we look at that, that's the what. So we define success criteria in the what, and we give them credit as part of our competitive bid process. So that's one aspect. Second is in our key suppliers, we have about 170 that dictate 70, almost 75% of total spend, 180. So there's a real Pareto. Right, so we want that in the performance criteria going forward. So whatever their maturity is, if it's a one, two, three, or four, and if you're looking for a maturity model, PSCI has a very good one. It's detail. If you whatever their maturity is, we look for them to improve upon that until they get to that penultimate where we think the commitment is appropriate across this space. So that's an annual continuous improvement exercise. And then finally, going back to cost itself. For if it's a low maturity supplier or others, um, we look to leverage collaborations uh, to help accelerate. So energize, activate some of the collaborations that Rob talked about. Um, so in other words, we wanted to find the what and we want to enable the how. So if they have specific questions on cost, platforms, management systems, other things, then a lot of times we'll facilitate that discussion with the key supplier. Um, we don't get into a cost specific discussion, but we facilitate where maybe they leverage one of our other suppliers that's in that same sector and they're more mature in the space, or um, we get them a resource that ha can help accelerate their journey um, for them. And if it's more specific or technical, um, so how do we go from, let's say, uh, co-generation to split that out because you have to use gas, right? So super detailed engineering, right? So then we'll look to connect maybe their SME on the supplier side with a subject matter expert from our side. So those SMEs can talk because again, we don't look at this to be a competitive, but we could talk about what our glide path is because we have a large unit of operation and help others with that glide path. But we don't dictate the how, we just look to enable the how. So hopefully that helps give a couple of things in terms of how we drive the what, right? Relative to selection and supplier performance management and enable the how. Thank you, Fred. And uh, we have another question. Maybe you can start, Rob, and maybe Fred can build on it. Um, does the need for buying sustainable solutions makes procurement managers look more positively on sourcing from startup or young companies 
which of course can be cheap and present an opportunity for saving. Mm. Well, we mentioned DE and I a few times in, in this presentation as well, and sustainability is not just about environment. We've got to remember that, and many of the organisations, perhaps on the call, I know certainly the ones present on the as, as speakers here, uh, have got DE and I programmes, diversity, equity, and inclusion, spinning out of the supply diversity programmes in the US. Perhaps we source a lot from small and diverse businesses. We employ a lot of work with a lot of small startup companies because of the industry we work in. We're looking for absolute cutting edge innovation in creating a new pipeline of medicines. And I know a lot of the suppliers that we engage with in our sustainable procurement program are in that bracket. Small businesses spin out to universities, some amazing scientists coming together to, to look at the next generation of pharmaceutical products and, and solutions for health problems globally. So we absolutely want to work with small and diverse businesses as diverse owned businesses. And yeah, we do recognize there's opportunities there for local sourcing. And perhaps just to turn the question slightly, I think, you know, the opportunity for local sourcing is something that I know some organizations are looking at since the pandemic and since other supply chain crises, such as the Suez Canal and other aspects. And that local sourcing, as well as small organization and diverse organization, I think is making some people think differently about supply chains. Transport's not always the biggest part of a supply chain, particularly in services. It's almost irrelevant with the digital world we all live in now. But in goods and services, there's there's real strengths and opportunities there. That, And I think th since the pandemic and since some of the other crises and the fuel, the costs, it is making people think differently to, to structure a really cost-effective and secure supply chain for the future. So absolutely recognize that. We really want to work with more small and diverse businesses um, to deliver sustainability. And I, one, one last thing on that, see, not just innovation in pharmaceuticals, but innovation is absolutely needed as we come through this new industrial revolution towards net zero. And so again, that's a real opportunity for business, real opportunity for those small startups to provide the new solutions. And we're open, we're open ears to listening for those and, and looking for those solutions for the future. Great, Rob. Zelia, Fred, do you want to build on that? Zelia? Yeah, I think, you know, in a lot of cases, the smaller suppliers are more agile. They're able to come up with innovative solutions. They're more enthusiastic about it in some cases because it's a bigger part of their business. And so it's really important as being in a larger company like we all are, and mine is much smaller than, than Rob's or Fred's, but, but still large enough that we are able to hire those smaller companies and really help them along with their journey and encourage them to not only um, have consulting type services, but also the products. You know, this, this space, especially with packaging, with looking at raw materials, um, it's, it's a difficult one in many cases, and it's it's great that we're able to work with all different kinds of suppliers that can offer us all different kinds of solutions. So we're absolutely um, ready and able to hire smaller suppliers. Yeah, I, I, I think it's the end is how I'd summarize. We're, we're, there is a scale leverage component to all of our supply chains, efficiency affecting this. Uh, pharma in particular, um, biotech pharma, there's a regulatory framework that adds a complexity, right? Time, line, and others that has to be always be considered, but there's an end in terms of becoming more nimble, innovative, and others. And it's just getting that benefit of both, right? And an overall mix, uh, market basket, if you will, um, in terms of the go forward position. So absolutely. Thank you all. We have another question specific for Rob. I have seen many attempts at procurement collaborations between industry peers fail. What are your top tips for making them work for them making them work based on the success you've seen in pharma that you have highlighted today? David, great question. Good to hear from you. I hope you're keeping well. I think we're overdue for a connect. Uh, but um, in terms of that collaboration, I think all collaborations, in fact, all business collaborations, I think are down to a common purpose and aligned purpose. As I mentioned in the in, when I was talking, it's the alignment is around that purpose in pharma. You know, we provide health solutions to health challenges, yet in producing 5% of the world's emissions, we cause part of the problem and we've got to solve that. That's a really strong purpose that means as fred said we're not competing it's not a competitive space we want to collaborate to find the solutions and often the solutions are common to all of us 
sort of things, solutions like renewable electricity, of course, are common to every business. Every business has used power um, and we can make those solutions. But I think the top tips for, for making them work is that common and aligned purpose and in sustainability, there's a really strong understanding within pharma that it's not a space to compete. It's, it's in fact, it's too important to compete on. Um, if we, if it, none of us will get over the line unless we all get over the line together on this. So, um, yeah, I think hopefully, David, that um, probably doesn't tell you anything new, but emphasizes probably what you already did know. Yeah, I, mean, I often get questioned about how do you have time to work on SPP or to work with PSCI or other kinds of organizations. And I'm often confused by that question because, in fact, it allows you to bring forth things that you're working on, to get input from others, to work together, and, and actually get a lot more done by everybody bringing everything together. And so I've never found it to be something that takes up my time, quite the opposite helps us get more done, helps us all move together, and helps us have a unified voice, which, I mean, you can only imagine, and, and I'm actually one of these suppliers, and I'm a supplier to both the other companies here, um, you, can, you can't even guess how many questionnaires we get, and how many um, different types of phone calls we get, and requests. And so the more that we can unify, the more that we can have a standardized voice, the better that it is for all of us in terms of being the ones that put the information out there and also being on the receiving end. So things like this are vital and it's really important that we all work together and that we're transparent and that we don't consider this a competitive space because if we consider it competitive and we don't work together. We're never going to get anywhere and we're just going to fail. Yeah, here, here. Um, I call that the leapfrog effect and uh, it's a super generous community. Um, where we share, build on each other's practices, share back. And, uh, and I think, you know, Zelia, Rob, Maria are fantastic at it, but SVP overall is that kind of fueled by people that volunteer and share. Um, good practices, not, not for credit, but for the benefit of the community. So I think if you're not involved in SVP, I'll just give it a plug. I think you should be. And I think if you want to accelerate your journey in that leapfrog effect, there's a lot of folks that are very generous in what they share. Thank you, Fred. Going back to the previous point, Chris is commenting to get the first sentence sustainability could be one example between beyond what ESC in smaller groups are quite effective rather than trying to involve everyone, but also mixing large and small and throughout the value chain can be more effective. Does anyone want to comment on that? About the Together for Sustainability as an example? I'll jump in there. I mean, I think, you know, pharmaceutical supply chain initiative is the collective for pharmaceutical companies together for sustainability. For those who don't know, is that is a, a very similar collective for the chemicals industry. Actually, the chemicals industry is often a supplier to the pharmaceutical industry. So you start to build that collection. Um, Ollie Hurry, who, you know, is is uh, part of the reason that we're all here somewhere in the somewhere in the distant distant past was always trying to connect these initiatives and have an initiative of initiatives and and fred everything you were saying about the spp absolutely support it's and zelia I, lo I love what you were saying there about actually being part of these helps us all move forward faster because if we're all back to the point i made about kind of shared and common goals and common approaches if we're all kind of heading in the same direction <clears throat> we'll have those conversations with suppliers that help us move forward and perhaps just to add to the points there is you know part of the role that see of the sustainable procurement team here in AstraZeneca is we're helping the industry move forward while all those different discussions in different categories are perhaps heading in slightly different directions or at different paces we've got to rise the tide on all boats and all categories and all industry sectors uh, that we buy from so it's um it's a key role the collaboration to support us, us individually Fred as you were saying to kind of progress and to, to really embed sustainability but to move forward as an industry actually collectively helps every individual to do that faster Thank you, Rob. And we have a Roby commenting, Fred, saying he loved the framing about enabling the owl. And he's uh, talking about this specific startup, Teralytic, with custom Mac for any material really quickly, looking to partner with companies to build out any workflow is if anyone would be interested. But do you want to share anything more about the owl, Fred? 
Yeah, I, I think um, the how is relative to the company, okay. right? Which is why we don't, it's, it's not a judgment, right? We assess maturity uh, and everyone has this, different circumstances, different margin, different uh, geographic location, different parts of their company, kind of from a, a startup organization to a more mature organization, different regulatory framework. Uh, and to be quite candid, our assumption is that you're doing the right thing for your company already and a lot of our interaction and all that. So we kind of put the how is in terms of basic compliance, right? So the kind of legacy corporate social responsibility. And we do verification processes based on risk assessment for a lot of that to make sure that that pulls through, right? From a regulatory framework and our standards that those are being achieved. A lot of what we're talking about today is the voluntary side of ESG um, supplier diversity, uh, as well as uh, net zero or decarbonization. It's that next level of enabling the how, and it is more complex from a compliance uh, standpoint, because depending upon where you are and your maturity and others, um, it's not all going to save you money. There is some cost in this next level of journey. We think it's a cost of doing business to mirror our values, right, going forward as an organization. But that's why we don't get into specifics on the how. We just want to enable it. And I think uh, companies like uh, Robbie's, others, we see a lot of these um, helping accelerate and very feasible for folks going forward. So um, our, our premise is that we start with compliance and then we build on that. And then we enable depend upon how you're pulling the rope, if you will, rather than us pushing, how you're pulling the rope, we look to enable that going forward. And the last thing I would say on enabling the how is we segment our suppliers in terms of overall impact intentionally just to make sure our resources are deployed where we think it will have the maximum benefit back relative to our supply chain. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, I think I it's extremely important to not be too prescriptive with the how, just like with your own teams internally, uh, just how you interact with, with other groups. You always want to make sure that there's the freedom to allow individuals, allow companies to do what is important to them, what they feel is right for them. And um, I think sometimes by being too prescriptive, you can actually stop innovation. You can stop new ideas. And um, you, you end up having a kind of relationship where there's no, there, where the thinking isn't there anymore. And it's more about just getting done exactly what you asked for. And that's exactly what you don't want with sustainability. You want it to be an open dialogue where everybody's contributing and really excited about it. I think the, the big advantage that we have with sustainability initiatives is people get excited about them. This is exciting. This is, um, you know, I love my career. I love what I've chosen to do. And when you have that, that's when you really get momentum and movement when everybody's having a great time with it. And really, um, it's important to them. And it's at the heart of everything we do. Thank you, Celia. We still have more than 200 people on the line. Are you sure there's really no other question for our fabulous speakers? Just let's wait a couple of seconds. If anyone has a last second thought or comment. If not, is there any final comment? Rob, so I, I'll give a, I'll give a question and I'll propose an initial answer. And it's not, you know, these forums, you know, you always get into uh, things. SEC uh, pulled back on the recent environmental disclosure rules in scope three. And I was asked internally, um, cause Maria in particular does a lot to drive scope three reduction. Are you nervous? Are you worried that the SEC and, and my answer was no. Um, in fact, um, anyone that's driving scope one, scope two, the direct emissions down should be driving scope three. And, and the reason being quite simply is economics. Whether you have to disclose to the SEC in your 10K or you know, quarterly reportings and others based on materially is, was never the driver for scope three, my view. It was more uh, the driver is that you're managing your emissions holistically and working with companies similar to base compliance that mirror your values going forward. And as a procurement or supply chain colleague, you're driving that within the industry and driving that influence. So I, I don't know if others have different views, but I didn't see that as um, 
a potential derailer or setback um, overall. I understand why they did it. And, and I think overall they're balancing their constituency and others, but I think from a program standpoint, it's not a setback, at least for us. You know, in, in my opinion, I don't think you can work on scope one and two without working on scope three, because they're all so tied together. In order to have a successful program, you have to work with your suppliers. If you didn't work with your suppliers, um, there's no way that you can progress on your sustainability journey. So I, I guess um, from, from my perspective, we now have a fancy title for it of scope three and, and having more formalized programs, but we've all been working with our suppliers. For, for years. I mean, I remember starting a, a supplier program 22 years ago and working with suppliers on these kinds of initiatives. So this isn't new, but it's becoming more and more important and it's becoming more and more integrated. And because we're, we're trying to track progress and to have some numbers around it, I, I think the scope three piece has become a very difficult data piece that we're all trying to manage. Um, but you know, I don't know how you could stop working with your suppliers. Thank you, Celia. So our call for questions was quite successful. So we have a lot of questions coming. So let's try to respond to all of them. So one is, what are some examples of solutions the most mature suppliers are implementing? Do you want to look at that, Rob? Yeah, I will do. Yeah, I think, you know, we look at some of our leading suppliers and and we're all using the same tools. This is not rocket science. We're using the same tools and systems. We're engaging our suppliers using tools like Ecovardis on an ESG baseline so they understand all of the risks and that includes an aspect of sustainable procurement. There's other tools available as well. We look forward in, and, and where we are now with tools like CDP, we get them to look forward with public platforms like science-based targets because it's about not just about where you are now, but it's where you're going. And again, I go back to that public demonstration of leadership which through cdp you can provide and certainly through sbti is there so i think that then you see the suppliers rolling that down their supply chain so that some of our key suppliers have set targets for 70 percent of their suppliers to have science-based targets by 2027 or 2030 and so that supplier cascade is is significantly important we're absolutely seeing some suppliers coming to us with real strong maturity solutions and this conversation is helping people we were just talking to a raw material supplier this morning who is saying look i can come to you with a product which has got 40 percent less carbon emissions in it because they're thinking about how they're sourcing so it's driving this demand signal as i think fred you said that strong demand signal from the sector is driving people to think differently finding innovation giving opportunities for small suppliers as we're asking as well so Look at the tools other people are using. I guess if you're not started, look at the tools other people are using. Use some of those. You'll find actually a lot of your supply chain is already using those tools, and that gives you a really fast start. Thank you, Rob. Another question actually is about the sustainable procurement maturity standard. Is there a maturity standard for pharma sector? Yes, that's a simple one, and Rob knows it well. But I think we'll leave that with the leave behind the PSCI as a very comprehensive, uh, and it's across multiple spaces. And I think it's a great starting point for any organization or supplier, right, in terms of what uh, buyers are looking for as well. Thank you, Fred. And maybe there's another question for you, Fred, again. What are some of the common challenges you have found in addressing the scope three emissions on your supplier base. You mentioned segmentation. Is that a segment more challenging than others? Well, I, I don't know if it's a segment of industry. I think it's a, a segment of region or geography. Um, yeah. Just follow the money when it comes down to it. If you look at North America policy, tax abatement, um, other funding mechanisms for renewable, and then look at Western Europe. Likewise, uh, and some of the European uh, carbon rules, right, in terms of going over uh, EU, right? It's just easier to execute and the cost structure is less because it's more mature. And some of that's policy into execution, right, going forward. So I'd say uh, some of those regions are ahead of the other regions, not that the other regions won't catch up. It's more difficult where a business or part of that business is located uh, in other parts of the world. And you have more complexity, India, China, um, even Singapore, it's a small island for us, right? Do you have the, some geographic and physical location limitations, which drives cost, 
um, or it could be policy and the governance associated with it, which also drives costs. So contract manufacturing, cl contract research, others. Um, when we look at that segmentation based on geography, it's, it's understandable that their commitment to SPTI or other factors may be lower. Now, I do think it will accelerate. And we're seeing a lot of that, as Rob said, and initiatives in India, China, but also LATAM and the solutions might be different, right? When we look at these, I think the idea is that we're asking and now governments are looking for it um, and then looking for that investment. But I think you have to go a little bit deeper than all, all players are equal or industries, they're not. I think geography has a big play in terms of renewable access or cost. Thank you, Fred. We have two final questions. And one is always for you. Can you elaborate a little more on how you integrated the marginal abatement cost curve into your procurement organization's practices and processes? Is that for me? And if so, I, I, I want to defer that because what I'd say is it's very focused and, and we could spend a session on that. So sure. maybe a follow-up pharma session uh, on that. So, um, and maybe one other question, Maria. Um, a quick one is, do you assess your suppliers at corporate or site level? Do you want to take things, Rob? Yeah, I can do. Yeah. In fact, it's both because it's important that we start at the top with a board level. Those SBTI commitments, the CDP reporting and increasingly Kavadis reporting is done at global corporate level. But of course, while we want that commitment from the board, what we want is the site level detail because it's the sites for manufacturing where those products are, are produced for us. So the M2030 that Zelia talked about, that's going from corporate global to site level. And then beyond site level, we start to talk about product carbon footprint, which is another whole session in itself. Thank you, Rob. So we have a final question, but maybe it's too late because I do realize that we have just a couple of minutes out. So maybe we will try to respond to these questions in writing. So I want to thank all our speakers. And again, if not, then yes, Piet, please join the pledge with us. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.